So yeah, welcome, uh, welcome, and uh, let's welcome Ana Selena. Uh, she's 15 years uh, into experience with uh, strategic marketing. She's going to show us uh, how to win clients by being yourself. Selena, thanks so much. Thanks for everyone joining us today here. Uh, I know that the giraffes are probably more interesting than a lot of us here in front of the stage, but uh, I'll try to keep this as valuable for you as possible. Uh, so first, just to introduce myself real quick, uh, the short version is Vasi. My full name is used only by my mom when I've done something wrong, or by Bulgarian <laughs> native speakers, so that's completely fine. Uh, if you want to find me on social media, you can, and I'll share a bit more about my website in a second. So this is actually where I'm going to start. And believe me, this has a connection to branding that we'll just get to in a second. I started blogging in 2017 under WordPress pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, this is my English speaking site. Uh, I had a Bulgarian version before that. It's all about marketing and branding. I get around 8,000 visits per month. It's targeted traffic, so people are interested in marketing in general. And um, let's play a quick game. So if you know this amount of info about my website, would you buy that? And let's start something small, like 20 euro or something like that. One person, thank you. <laughs> thank you guys in the back. You get a beer on me later. Uh, let's see if someone raises to 50. I didn't understand the question. If you would buy a blog with 8,000 targeted visitors who are interested in marketing. Buy okay, a few yeah. going there. So I'm not gonna push my luck. <laughs> I'm not gonna go further. But you see that with as little information as possible, we're already getting somewhere. And actually, brands in general can be much more expensive. Uh, there's an international study by a consulting group called Interbrand. So they have this methodology where they're trying to figure out how uh, much a brand is worth. At the top of the list, we have Apple at $408 billion. That's billion with a B. So we can imagine like, okay, there's something there, brands are important, but why does it cost so much? Like, what's the value of a brand and why should I care specifically? And a brand can be a wonderful thing if people know about you, or it can be completely useless if done the wrong way. And I'm going to try to show you how to do a brand well, how to create a brand that's worth it for you as a business, for you as a professional, and uh, for <coughs> your clients to recognize and be interested in. But even if we talk about the value of a brand, what is it really? So if we take Starbucks as an example, is it just the logo, the mermaid that we've all seen? Probably not. Actually, if we want to get deeper into the brand, we can look at uh, what Starbucks claims they stand for. They say they stand to inspire and nurture the human spirit. This is their uh, mission. And this may be something you find interesting or believe in, or you may just think it's BS. But that's up to you. How well of a job the marketers at Starbucks do depends on what percentage of people are going to say, yes, this is inspiring, versus how many people are going to say, yeah, that doesn't really do it for me. But we can go even on a bigger scale. Uh, the Starbucks brand is about the products they sell, the story you get about where and how they source their coffee, or even the imaginative way every barista in Starbucks can write down your name with like at least three different spelling mistakes. All of that is part of the brand. All of that is part of what you think of when you think about Starbucks. And actually Jeff Bezos put it really well. A brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So what we want to do <coughs> is 
create a brand that inspires people, inspires your clients, inspires the people you meet at WordCamps, inspires your, <coughs> the people you work with on an everyday basis to talk about you, to talk about you well, to say nice things, to recommend you to others, and to give that special personal recommendation that's gonna win you business over the long run. So, if we're talking about brand building, there's a very simple formula that is gonna help you really differentiate yourself from others. And the reason we need to differentiate is that if we don't differentiate, if we don't, don't show that there's something else there that we're standing for something, we'll have to compete on price, we'll quickly become a commodity, and we are probably at one point gonna have to drive ourselves in the ground through cutting costs, lowering prices, getting projects we're not really passionate about. And you can, on an intuitive level, know what's the difference between a really good, let's say, web consultant or a web developer and someone you can get for five bucks an hour on Fiverr. But the difference between the two is kind of hard to pin down and even harder to develop. So how do we develop that? What's stand behind brand building? It's three main components and as always, simplifying <coughs> something down to just three things is gonna make it sound a bit too simple to be true, and it is, but I'll have to use a formula, <coughs> otherwise we can stand here for a couple of more hours and I don't think anyone who's looking forward to lunch would want that. So I'll have to play around here. So first off, to build a good brand, you need others to know you, then you need them to like you, to like what they hear about you, to be interested in what you have to say, and quite crucially, you need them to trust you. <coughs> so my aim here today is to tell you how to achieve each of these three components and do that well. So let's first think about the first one, so knowing or awareness, as we say in marketing jargon. What's that? <coughs> well, the reason you need others to know you is that the more they know, the more they're gonna care. For the people in the back, I'm gonna read a few lines of this, and I hate when speakers do that, but I'm just gonna, it's gonna help me drive my point home, so I'm gonna allow it this on time. This really grumpy gentleman says, I don't know who you are, I don't know your company, I don't know your company's product, I don't know what your company stands for, so on and so forth. Now, what was it you wanted to sell me? <coughs> if they don't know us, they're not gonna be interested in what we can do for them, simple as that. So any new client that comes by, they first need to learn a bit about you to be really interested in what you have to sell. And to get there, we need to share a bit about us. We need to show um, who we are, as people and as professionals, I'm gonna get into it in a few minutes, but it's really important to show both these sides because this is what's gonna build trust. <coughs> of course, we need to show what we can do, the products or services that we're selling. We need to show our track <coughs> record, we need to show what we can do for them. Case studies are a particularly important point here, but I'm not going to delve deeper into that. If you're interested, we can talk about it after I finish the talk. But more importantly, we need to give them an idea of what we stand for um, and what our personality is like, so what we value. When it comes to value, people in the WordPress community have a very strong point to talk about, and that's open source. So talking about why open source is important, sharing what you know, giving them an idea of uh, the volunteer work you do in maintaining WordPress. These can all be important things to bring home in order to show that you're not just there about the money, you're there to do work you're proud of. And this can be work done together with a client. So this is all well and good, but how do we get there? And how can, we, how can we do that? 
there's a few simple things I'm going to talk about here. And of course, if we dive deeper, there's always a lot more. But if we can look at the three most important things to me, it's <coughs> meeting up with people, first and foremost. So being visible in the space you're in. This can be joining a WordCamp. It can be going to a meetup. But it can also be a virtual meeting place. It can be a Slack community or an online group of sorts or an online community where your particular type of clients gather and gather en masse. Being there and being visible is the first step to draw curiosity. <coughs> I know that there's probably been a bunch of people here that we've seen each other at a previous event, at the previous WordCamp, and maybe I'm just a face in the crowd. Next time we meet, it's going to be more than that. Next time we meet, we might talk more about what work each of us does. Next time we meet, we might already start discussing a potential partnership. And that's how this connection can be built during a longer period of time. <coughs> but it's not just about meeting, it's also about sharing what you know. So my particular way of doing that is creating a blog about marketing where I share some insights about the work I do and how a company can do it on their own. It can be uh, anything really from a simple how-to to a more in-depth guide, but sharing what you know is going to show people that you're more than a price tag with a specific service list. You're a person who's passionate about sharing that. And the third component, and I think all of these are super applicable to the WordPress community, the third one is helping out. Helping others out with any information you can, be it answering a simple question, be it helping a marketer like myself fix something they <coughs> broke on their site because they're just a marketer and have mm -hmm. zilch understanding of code whatsoever. It can be helping uh, someone who's just trying to fix a simple bug. This time it might be helping them out with a few lines of uh, a comment or a few lines of code. Next time it can be helping them out with a more uh, substantial project that you want to work on. And often when it comes to this point, especially when I talk about sharing and helping others out and so on, there comes a question of, okay, like this is all well and good, but if I'm sharing a lot, will they really want to work for, with me or are they just going to do the job themselves? And from my experience at least, this isn't really the case. The step from knowing someone to hiring them to do a work for you can be very small if you show that you're going into that relationship with an open mind and being there with the position of wanting to help someone else do a good job. So this is an example uh, from my own blog. Uh, I share a lot about different ways you can conduct marketing research or conduct different marketing <coughs> strategy tasks. And this is a super lengthy guide about a specific technique for customer research <coughs> known as jobs to be done. This is like according to the plugin I use for reading time, it's a 25 minute read. It has a bunch of templates. It has a ton of information and the step-by-step -step process I use, the tools I use, and literally anything you need in order to go on and start doing that on your own. In theory, a person will be very easily swayed to just read that, get the templates, jump on, and do the work themselves. But what happens often is something a bit different. It's getting emails like this where people say, hey, this was an amazing, uh, extensive article. I really liked what you had to say. Can you do the job for me? Because now that I understand it better, I understand just how much work is involved in that. And I can assume that you, having the experience to outline that really clearly, even for a novice like myself, you'll be the right professional to do the job for me. 
because more often than not, if, if people want to have a job done right, they're going to hire someone who knows about it. They're just not going to do it themselves. So let's get that out of the way and really like continue on sharing and helping others. Because I think that's the, the most useful marketing tactic you can take from the talk today. <coughs> The second category uh, is like, and this means not just showing the person who you are, but getting them to care. Getting them to be interested in what you have to say and getting them to start thinking about, okay, is this a person I want to know more about and know more of? This is the marketer's holy grail engagement. This is where you get to build a proper relationship. And when it comes to getting to like, I think the way we can do that in the most direct, most efficient, and most substantial way is by, as Albert Einstein says, becoming a person of value. So sharing information that's useful and giving them an understanding uh, that you'll be satisfying their needs and you'll be helping them <coughs> get value, even at first contact, but more importantly once you start working on a project together. And the reason I like to talk about value and the reason that whenever I talk about marketing I always end up talking about value is that it works like a flywheel. It looks like <coughs> a self-propeller that's going to get you more awareness, it's going to get you more engagement and it's going to get you more eyeballs and more potential needs. So the way this works is pretty simple and we understand it on like an intuitive level, but once laid down, it's uh, much easier to grasp. So the first bit is obviously bringing more value to more people. So write what you know, share what you know. And when I say write, that's my preferred mode of operating. Uh, you might be doing a podcast or you might be doing vlogs or you might be doing uh, how to recording of uh, a particular function and so on and so forth. But it's about bringing the value to others. Once that happens, once people see valuable content, they engage with it. And when I say engage, it's not just about like the likes, comments, and shares on social media. It's about getting people to really read through what <coughs> you have to say or listen through a video that you've recorded. It's about getting them to really ask questions at the end, which is why speakers always love getting questions at the end of the talk. It shows that it has been relevant, that it has been valuable, and everyone's been paying attention. It's about getting them to share that information with people who might benefit from it as well. Because whenever I find an article that's interesting to me, I'll share it with a bunch of colleagues because I know it will be interesting for them as well. You probably do that too. And this is how content gets shared and how it starts reaching more people and how that content becomes more visible. And with it, you become more visible yourself as a professional. And this works like a flywheel because once this content gets more visible, it reaches more people who engage with it more, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, to me, this is the only real way marketing can be built on. It's built on value. It's not built on gimmicks. I can give you a bunch of different growth hacks that are gonna work today and probably not gonna work tomorrow. But if we need to distill it down to something, it's gonna be value and it's gonna be this. But value is a very broad word. So if we need to look at it in more detail, like what actually is it? There's three different types of value we can talk about. So first one, it's informational value. It's, for example, this talk is more of an informational talk. It's giving you information about what the brand is. It's giving you information about what branding is in general and how you can achieve it. Then the second type of value is functional. So this is essentially teaching someone to do something. Every how-to guide, every decent stack overflow answer brings functional value in some shape or form. And then there's emotional value. And in business, we often focus only on the first two. 
but the third one is just as important. <coughs> um, <coughs> good WordCamp talk is not just about being very informative, it's about being interesting to listen to and easy to follow and something that you're gonna remember because it's being curious to hear. So some examples here uh, on each of these three. My favorite example for informational value is the SEO website Backlinko. They, uh, he got acquired by SEMrush a while back, but that doesn't really matter. So what you need to know in terms of this talk is that <coughs> every piece on Backlinko's website is a very thorough, very detailed, information-packed article that you're going to read through today and you're probably going to save to read again tomorrow because it's just so dense with information. Uh, one of the um, trademarked, <laughs> almost, uh, type of quotes that he has are definitive guides like this one. This one is on landing pages, but he has a, a number more. And the reason this works, the reason this is a good piece is twofold. First off, Brian Dean, the author uh, of the website, knows what questions his audience asks, what information are they interested in. And then comes the second component, which is answering this in, in a high quality, interesting, informative, remarkable, unique kind of way. So it's about knowing what to talk about and knowing how to talk about it. And you would often see people focusing on the second component of this, which is like, you know, finding the best design for a piece or talking about uh, formatting or talking about like how can you make your videos look good and so on. But to me, the first question is even more important. And it's about knowing what to talk about. It's about really understanding where your audience is coming from and what you need to tell them <coughs> that's going to be valuable. So a different example that really shows that function is more important than the form of the piece is the success of this guy. He's called Marcus Sheridan. He uh, is the owner of a business in the US that focuses on uh, designing, building, and installing fiberglass pools in the US. They did what? all different uh, fiberglass companies would do. They had a huge showroom that showed their uh, different products. They got people in, they had their sales team show them around the showroom and say how amazing their products are. And then 2008 hit and the crisis hit and everyone knows how that went for um, getting uh, new property and beautifying this property, for example, with a fiberglass pool. So they were in a tight pickle, and they needed to figure out a new way of marketing that didn't rely on getting people to a showroom, or even having a showroom to begin with. So what Marcus did was tell every one of his salespeople, when you go out and you get a question from a customer, any question that's related to fiberglass pools, write it down, and when you come back, you're gonna share that with the marketing team and we're gonna create a piece on our blog about it. He wanted to create what he said was the Wikipedia of fiberglass pools. And he was quite successful with that. His business started growing again. And then in the end, he transferred from being the owner of a fiberglass pool company to being one of the most successful content marketers out there. He has a book that's called you, uh, They Ask, You Answer, which is talking about that particular way of doing marketing. And it's all about answering customers' questions. So if you can get there, if you can get like super curious about what your customers or potential customers want to know, you'll be doing good marketing. You'll be on the way to doing like to getting to that like component. And as I said, emotion is still big in business. I can give you a lot of examples. This is one of my favorite ones, and although it's for products rather than personal brands, it's pretty applicable here as well. Uh, this is 
the owner of Dollar Shave Club, which was one of the first D2C brands. Uh, they started way back in 2012. And what they are selling is a subscription service for razors. I'm sure quite a few of you have probably heard about them. If you haven't, go online, go to YouTube, and look for Dollar Shave Club, and you see this commercial, where uh, this is still from their first commercial, which aired in 2012. So what they did was a very simple video that they put online on March 6, 2012, just a random day that wasn't like a big holiday or anything like that. And what happened afterwards was super interesting. They got 12,000 signups just by launching the video in 48 hours. They didn't have a huge budget. They had about $4,500 uh, $4, that was mainly used for the production of the video itself. And since this was in 2012, I'm pretty sure that the same quality video you can now do for probably like 1,000 bucks or something like that because technology is getting cheaper and more accessible. And up to uh, when I first did that research, the video had 25 million views, currently it has something like 27, which isn't really important. The important thing is that they succeeded in using emotion to sell a product that no one considered buying before because subscription for razors wasn't really something you did. No one knew the brand because it was like a completely new thing out there, but they still got the ball rolling. And in 2016, they got acquired by Unilever for like one billion dollars in cash. Or so that's a good example of building up a brand. And here, I'm cautious that this is a, a D2C example. It's um, it's talking about like end users, and most of you are doing business with the other businesses. But in the end of the day, we're all human, so we all react to emotion you wouldn't stand at an event if you didn't feel positive about it. So it goes to show emotion is everywhere. And the final third component here is trust. And I think uh, this is one of the most important things when it comes to our particular line of work, being all digital professionals and so on. Because it isn't really a product you're selling. There isn't like a specification that you need every time you work with a client. You really need to show them and to instill in them that trust that you're going to do a good job. And this is, frankly, the only way we can build business. And Zig Ziglar, <coughs> one of the most famous uh, salesmen in the world, he brings on the same point. You only do business with someone you trust. You might listen to others too, but you only do business and you exchange value and money with someone that you trust. <coughs> and here, the most important bit about building that trust that I want to bring to you today is being an authentic expert. So what do I mean by that? Well, first let me show you some stats. So this is uh, our survey that gets done every year, it's called the Edelman Trust Barometer, and it explores a bunch of different um, dimensions of trust. And one of the most curious ones is who do people deem credible or extremely credible? And there's two bits here that are relevant to mine and yours work here. One is technical experts, the other is a person like myself. These are two of the top three most credible spokespeople. So we are all, in a sense, technical experts. We have the expertise, uh, and we have the skills, and we have the knowledge, and we need to show that through the value of the code. We need to show that through um, uh, different case studies that uh, can express how we help companies and how can we build uh, this value for the clients we work with. But at the same time, we need to show that we're human too. And so there's this intersection of trust that we need to focus on. So it's not just about the professional, it's about the personal element as well. And we're not just all businessy like, we're humans. And 
to get there to sh become trustworthy, we need to show that side too. And this is, I think, all about vulnerability and showing what you're really made of. So one would be admitting mistakes. Uh, this is an example from my company, uh, a company I used to work for. It's a startup that creates um, a resume building app, but that doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that whenever we were writing content and creating content, we were very open about stuff that we didn't get right, stuff that customers were mm, not happy with, or stuff that didn't quite make sense, or stuff that didn't really work the way it was supposed to. And whenever you admit mistakes and you get there from a point of humility, you're showing that you really know what's going on. You're showing that you can really be better and get better and focus on becoming better for your customers. Another example, this time more on the personal brand note, this is probably one of the articles they got the most response. Um, from in the last two years or something like that, we're always talking about the issue of burnout and how that affects the work of a freelance marketer. And this isn't something that, especially <coughs> in my part of the world, in Eastern Europe, this isn't really something people talk about. You're not talking about mental health that much. But when you can get out there and you can share what you've been through, you become more relatable by being vulnerable. And of course, one thing I started with, uh, almost going to end with, with, is standing <coughs> up for something. Showing what you value, showing that you're treating bigger trends and bigger issues from the point of view of an expert, but also from the point of view of a human being, and that you're in the same boat as your customers. So this is an example from um, DHH, who's the founder of Basecamp, and who created a uh, service, an email service called Hey, that really got into a proper David versus Goliath fight with Apple when Apple told them that they're not going to let them have their app on the App Store if they're not funneling all payments through the App Store ecosystem. And this got all the way to Congress hearings and it had huge impact, but it's also the reason why a lot of people heard about Hey. A lot of people who didn't know about Basecamp before heard about it, and why the HH became sort of like a household name for everyone fighting against them. And you can stand up for something in less of like uh, um, a direct confrontational way, but if you're talking about the stuff you know and the stuff you care about, you're going to become more trustworthy because you're not afraid of going into topics that might be controversial. So I asked you at the beginning if you would buy my blog or not. Uh, and the point I was trying to make was about the value of a brand. It's been something I've been building up for quite a long time. And I wanted to sort of do a back of the napkin calculation. Obviously, Interbrand is going to never be interested in evaluating my personal brand. But I can do it pretty easily because I know how much money is coming in from projects and I know how much time I'm investing in developing new content, which is the main way I'm doing marketing <coughs> and doing brand building currently. So this is a very simple graph that I've cut on purpose about money in the bank for my company. And what I can tell you is that with a simple blog that doesn't get updated as often as I want to, I'm still getting a very high ROI on building a brand with the tools and um, approaches that I talked about today. So this is what I'm doing. It has been working for me, and I think it can work for you as well. So yeah, that's it from me. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you for your talk. Uh, for example, um, I'm from Serbia, and I wouldn't get uh, any brand if I didn't if I didn't hire 
if I didn't, uh, let's say, gave some free HTML teams and free this and that, and got a client from USA, and then we build value to the yields. So it's kind of, I think, different from country to country, how they see you. Yeah, they think you're good, but they just, you have to create something online to share, for example, this time for free. And I think at this Amazon and Disney, they're kind of monopolies, so they're like a big, big company, but, you know, um, I don't think that they are, um, you know, you, can, you cannot compare them, like, okay, I want to be an Amazon, I cannot, ever. Yeah. But, but, but um, that's not this other question. It's just different from uh, country to country. In Serbia, it's like that. In USA, it's maybe much better to create a brand, but it's not in Serbia. So you have to really give for free things, and you said if you're giving for free, then maybe they wanna, they don't want to work with you, but you have. <laughs> in this sense, that's how you're creating through the years brands. So it's not so easy, you know. I appreciate that you said that, but it's so different from country to country to get the USA cars. Well, I'm, I'm a neighbor. I'm from Bulgaria. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I know what you mean. It, we have, like, without being, like, a, a native English speaker even, yeah. or, or a person who's, like, e even, like, looking at the name, it sounds weird, you know, <laughs> to, to some English speakers. So, so that's a barrier we need to go over. Mm -hmm. But I think that still, uh, the example I gave with the jobs to be done um, in-depth guide, this is what I'm trying to do, and this is what I think can work for, for most digital professionals as well. Because, as I said, like, I give a lot, but people, once they understand how much work goes into that work, they are gonna be more inclined to hire you because they've already seen that, that you know your stuff, you know how it gets done. So in that sense, it can be a free version of a team, it can be a free version of a, of a plugin, or even a description of like a common issue. Like, I've actually hired developers to do s very basic <coughs> stuff, like help me do better email marketing automation, just because I stumbled across an article of how to connect my specific plugin with my particular email system, and I was like, I'm not gonna do that myself, I'm just gonna like, you know, work with that guy because he knows what he's talking about. Thank you. A question? Yeah, thank you. It's uh, not a question, uh, um, but I want to confirm uh, that uh, the three points, uh, no uh, share, no and uh, um, uh, trust, uh, it's, yeah. uh, and no like uh, I'm a uh, work meter, uh, work uh, WordPress meetup organizer in uh, Hamburg, Germany. And, uh, um, if someone uh, has a meetup too, uh, it is a great idea to uh, to to know each other. So if you um, say your name and what you do in your meetup groups, people know the other people and know what they are doing. And then maybe exactly. they, they will do a talk uh, on this meetup, and then I know oh, uh, he's an expert in this area, and then maybe I will trust him or her and um, I, I know him, I, uh, he's sharing, uh, she's sharing uh, her uh, in this uh, um, area uh, yeah, expertise. Uh, expertise. Yeah. And, uh, and then the just is just the, the, the normal uh, um, row of, of things that happen here because uh, I know exactly what um, they do. I know I can trust them uh, in their expertise area, and then I will hire them. Exactly. Yeah. That's uh, that's one of the of the great things I think the WordPress community has gotten right is that you guys and like I part of that, but more on the outside looking and being more technical is that we know what other people do. We know who we can talk to if we have a, a problem. And this becomes sort of like a, an exchange of value that build on personal relationships, which is great. Please tell me you have a question. How did you calculate that ROI uh, for your um, brand, besides the personal brand myself? And it's quite challenging, I think, to calculate that. So what are the costs that you uh, that went into that? And, uh, yeah, um, as I said, it's more of a back of a napkin calculation. I I keep track of my time, so I know how much time I invest in 
writing, um, speaking at events, giving presentations, and so on. So I can calculate that if I was, like, what's the opportunity cost there? If I was spending that on working with a client, how much would that bring in? And then, uh, on the other hand, the graph I showed, it's, it's actual money in the bank for, for my company. So that's sort of, thi this shows like the development over time. And then if I, if I divide the, the cost of my work and against uh, the money that I'm getting, the revenue that I'm getting, it's sort of how that was done. Is there no revenue on the website itself? <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, flying for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.